We are so honored to have uh, a man who is just one of us, a longtime friend of the Institute. In fact, not, not only did he love the Acton Institute when he was the chairman of our board of directors, he stole our name when he left. <laughs> he, uh, he went and started edu you know, uh, educational academies uh, around the country that are so innovative. Uh, auto learning, you'll hear something about that, I suppose. But also the Acton MBA program, which people keep calling the Acton Institute and ask us uh, how they can enroll in our Acton MBA program. <laughs> so we take their fees. <laughs> but Jeff will tell you about that. This, this man is... I don't know if I say he's an entrepreneur first and a teacher, or a teacher and an entrepreneur, or maybe just kind of both together. He's certainly very entrepreneurial in his pedagogy, the way he presents. And having served on the board of directors of the Acton Institute with him for eight or nine years, something like that, overlapped with Secretary DeVos, as we mentioned last night, <clears throat> It felt like I was in one of those MBA seminars just being on the board with him. The uncomfortable questions that he would ask, that we would have to think about. You know, you just want, what's the financial balance? What's the management thing? You know, something like that. Not these kinds of questions. Why? What would you do if the stock market dropped 5,000 points? What would you, you know, these kinds of things that if our organization now ha is a strong, well-managed, well-run, effective organization, this man has a lot to do with having injected that into our DNA. Uh, one of the <coughs> interesting things about him, when we met, in, uh, he lives in Austin, Texas, and he was a professor at the, uh, can I talk openly about that? I mean, it's, it's probably all over the Wall Street Journal, but, um, he was a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Texas, Austin, and taught entrepreneurship to these young people, you know, teaching them about innovation and creativity and risk and all of these kinds of things. And it was so incredible. He was one of the highest ranked of the teachers. Every year, he'd get these high rankings from the students. Well, the university couldn't take him anymore. He was too innovative, too creative, which is why he said, okay, if we can't do it the way we think it needs to be done, we'll create the Acton MBA, which is one of the highest, if not uh, the one or two highest ranked entrepreneur programs in the United States. Uh, so you have a great opportunity here. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard Business School, served for two decades on the board of the Harvard Business School, uh, also worked uh, with the National Review Board, Philanthropy Roundtable, one of the youngest people ever to um, uh, be named to the Hall of Texas Business Hall of Fame, and the greatest thing I can say about him is that he is a, a friend and a real father and husband and believer. So welcome, Jeff Sandiford. I remember calling uh, probably, gosh, 15 years ago and saying, do you mind if I use the board Acton's name for this new school? We, it, he tells it that we left the university. We actually got fired. So I've just gotten fired. Can we borrow the name? And he said, oh, you know, no one will ever hear of either one of us, so it'll be just fine. So we, we, we get calls for the Acton Institute all the time as well. Thank you, Father Sirico. Do you remember how it felt to be six years old? The world was full of possibilities. You were full of curiosity. Alive, a natural learner perhaps even convinced that you were a superhero. What if you were right? What if children really are more capable than we ever imagined? Education, 
student-teacher ratios, common core, standardized test, control, regurgitation, oversight. 19th century solutions in the 21st century. Perhaps this makes sense to some until you ask the question, what if children really are far more capable than we ever imagined? Google shares information, Uber shares cars, and Airbnb shares rooms. What if children could share learning with each other in a tightly bound community with extremely high standards of excellence? What if they became convinced that they could know that they would change the world and find a deep burning need in their soul that matched a deep burning need in the world? Welcome to my world, currently as a middle school teacher, or as we call them, guides, in a learner-driven community at the Acton Academy. Not the MBA, it's the K-12 Academy. It's a place founded on the belief that each person who enters our doors, parent, child, or guide, deserves to find a calling that will change the world. Now, for the next 15 minutes, I'd like to ask you to go on a journey with me, not to a utopia where learning and transformation are easy, because transformation is never easy. Not to a well-oiled machine, because human beings don't work that way. But it is an insider's tour of a place where magic happens, because we serve heroes in the making. Pay close attention. You may even sense the whispers of a great educational awakening. Now, why should you care? Because like the brick and mortar competitors of Google and Uber and Airbnb, the power structure of your world, I predict, is about to change. And I'm about to give you a glimpse of your future. You can ride out the storm in the old world, and I predict you'll have about as much fun as journalists, taxi cab drivers, and budget motel operators are having today, <laughs> fighting over the scraps of a dying industry. Or you can join a revolution, helping young people, inspiring and equipping them to take learning into their own hands. Our journey started when it came time to move our two boys, Charlie and Sam, from the Montessori school, where they were learning into a more traditional environment. I went to our older daughter's uh, classical middle school, and I found the very best teacher there. And I went in to see him, and I said, when should we move our boys? And he said, without even thinking, as soon as possible. I was, thought it was kind of a quick answer, so I said, well, well why? And he said, well, once they've, once they've had that kind of freedom, they just can't stand sitting at a desk and having someone talk to them eight hours a day. And before I could even stop myself, I said, well, I don't blame them. And then this great teacher, he was a tall man, he looked down for the longest time, and I thought I'd offended him, I kind of felt badly. And then he looked up and he had tears in his eyes, and he very softly shook his head, and he said, I don't, I don't blame them. I thought about these two young guys, and I went home and I told my wife, we're done. We can homeschool, we can start a school, but I'm not putting them in a place where they're going to be talked at for eight hours a day. And so the Acton Academy was born. Now, I started to do some research about this time and tried to learn, and most of you in this room know, you know about factory schools, but I started to read back of what how did that get started? And once you understand the idea of the factory, factory metaphor, which many of us in do, you know, suddenly everything about traditional education begins to make sense. The desk all in ordered rows, the person at the top standing up, I talk, you listen. Uh, even the uh, industrial lockers, you know, that, that line the halls. But here's what's more interesting. That's not how the United States started. Because if you go back to the revolutionary times, we had the one-room schoolhouse, 
We had apprenticeships at a very young age. We had, by the way, interestingly, contracts where at about the age of six, you would go down the street to another family for moral instruction. You actually move to another, you would have a contract of how you were really morally educated because, and my son Charlie's here today, no one ever listens to their parents, right? They <laughs> might listen to the guy down the street, but not the parents. So we had this system that was antiquated, thrown together, odd, except for the fact that we built the strongest, fairest, and richest nation in the face of, on the face of the earth before there was ever an organized school system. And it was good enough for Madison and Jefferson and Washington and later even Lincoln uh, and Edison. So as we began to do that, we, we started over with a blank sheet of paper with this Acton Academy and said, okay, what should learning be about? And we came up with there were really four questions that mattered. And everything about the place is built around these four questions. The first question is, who am I and where am I going? Father Sirico would like this one. Who am I and where am I going? What tools and skills will I need? And importantly, which ones should I master? Where are my gifts? Who will affirm me and hold me accountable? And finally, how can I prove what I can do? Now, I'm going to give you four rather odd metaphors, so stay with me for a minute, and I'll try to bring all this together. But if you want to bring this together in one set of pictures, it's Superman and the Hero's Journey, Google and Gaming, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the Boy Scouts. If you can hold those four metaphors for a moment, I'll unwrap this. The single most powerful thing we've discovered, and this is one thing that you can actually implement across all schools in the world today, is the idea of the hero's journey. That every child is gifted. Every child is a genius. And before you tell me that it doesn't mean 180 IQ, when you look it up in the dictionary, it says has a unique special skill. Every child is a genius. And they are a hero on their way for a calling that will change the world. If you believe this, young people respond. If you have one person working in your organization that doesn't believe it, like an animal smells fear, they know it, and they shut down. <clears throat> Secondly, Google and gaming, all the latest adopted, adaptive software for where it works, for the kinds of skills where you can learn. I'll get into this in a moment, but we have not taught one minute of math or one minute of writing in our schools. And the young people are advancing at two to three grade levels every year on the one test we give and becoming beautiful writers and wonderful thinkers. They have lots of teachers, but the teachers work for them. They're not in the studios. The studios are almost completely run. So this adaptive software for the things it does well is incredibly powerful and getting better every day. But also it means hands-on projects. The children on the right believe they're in Thomas, and Menlo, in Thomas Edison's Menlo Park lab creating electricity patents. So hands-on projects, we call them quests, where you're actually searching for to do something important in the real world, creating it with your hands, and importantly, at the end of every six weeks, there's a public exhibition. So you are, you are serving the public. It's not a science fair for parents. It's actually something inviting customers in and actually serving them something. So that's Google and gaming. How do you affirm, how will you affirm me and hold me accountable? We've really modeled the whole program on Alcoholics Anonymous, this idea of having contracts between people created by the young people that define a civil society. Like the Constitution, they can be amended. Like the Declaration of Independence, they're built on beliefs. But the entire place is run with a system of contracts that limit the power of adults to the things where we need to have power, very few, and uh, put self-governance in the hands of the young people. We will have week, a week go by that no adult will enter the middle school studio, to give you an idea. We believe we are on our way to having um, one adult for every 100 students. We're at three adults now. When I say adults, I mean including admissions, janitorial, everything. So why is this important? Because we are now at about $4,000 per student per year we think we can get down to $2,500 per student per year all in. If you throw in the apprenticeship income, the number approaches zero. 
Now again, the students have dozens of teachers. They have all the mentors they can handle and they're running in these one room schoolhouses of multi-ages. The older students are helping the younger ones and the younger ones are helping the older ones. So there's a constant flow between elementary, middle and high school of people working on different things. But you will walk on campus and it'll go a long way before you see an adult and they're likely to be sitting somewhere working on something else. Finally, how do I prove what I can do? A system of modular badges with very strictly defined limits and high standards of excellence, all peer reviewed by the students themselves, along with portfolios that describe the calling, and all of which can be mapped into a traditional transcript. So if you want to go to a traditional college who wants to see a traditional transcript, you can see one exactly like the one that we got for our daughter that cost $37,000 a year, and as I remember clearly. Uh, so her high-end high school prep school, she was too old to go to this, they have a beautiful transcript. Ours looks exactly like theirs because I copied theirs, so I know it looks exactly. <laughs> so if you were a college administrator or a college admissions officer age 25 going through stacks of these hyped up on caffeine deciding who gets in Princeton and who doesn't, ours looks just like theirs, and you just stamp it and go on and we're as fully accredited as anybody else. But the badges allow complete flexibility and modularity and creativity within a structure that determines that you have excellence and can, at least until we no longer have to, map into what looks like a traditional college degree. So just for a second longer, a little more on how this works. Here's the, uh, we started out in a small house with seven young people. Today, we have a uh, 100 people, uh, 100 students on campus uh, here's a view of looking out at the high school from the middle school and the elementary school on the left. Um, here's the more interesting part. We've accidentally stumbled into something. Uh, we had a family approach us, a friend, and said, look, I'd like one of these for my children, but I live in Guatemala. Can you give us? And so we sent him down a big disorganized stack of stuff after we were in business about six months. And we had another family after a year that the, the uh, Husband and wife wanted to move to California, and the wife said, I'm not leaving. I don't care how good the job is if I can't have an acting academy because it's transformed our kids. So we gave them a stack of stuff. Six months later, we were learning more from them than they were learning from us. And we said, you know what? We should go from this, our one location, to the one in Guatemala and the one in California. Let's open 10 so we can get more experimentation going. So we'll reach out to a few more people. Today, we have 50 open around the world. We'll open 30 to 50 more schools. We hope this year we're limited by capacity of what we can do. We're trying to catch up. We have 6,000 applications to open a school around the world. So something is going on. This is with very limited marketing, all mostly word of mouth. So something is going on with parents. In fact, our, our Grand Rapids Acton Academy owners are sitting right there. So something's going on in this world of people hearing and picking this up. Now, a couple more things about how this works, and then I'm gonna open up for questions. We've learned a lot of lessons along the way. One of them is, and as someone who loves to read and to learn, I hate to say this, but the whole idea of learning to know doesn't really matter much in the age of Google. We have rewarded people for having high IQs and drawings that fire fast and being able to retain and regurgitate information it is no longer a very interesting skill. It's really not. What we've stumbled onto, though, are three things that do matter. One of them is learning to learn, and I want to make clear what I mean by this. We all have hundreds of algorithms of how we know how to do everything from brush our teeth to tie our shoes to create an electrical grid that will self-emergently, uh, over time, tie into itself and power the United States of America. There are these things we know how to do, and there are processes for doing them. So at the school, what we do is we take a big, difficult goal, get the Eagles excited about doing it six weeks from now, and then we develop and discover the processes for doing it. There are three great processes for anything you can imagine on the Internet if you just Google them. Our Eagles will find all three and then spend six weeks debating which of the series of steps writes the best novel or the best poem or creates the best electricity grid. Learning to know is about going through the muscle routine of learning processes that will get something done. That gets me to the learning to do 
it's all about getting something done. Don't get me wrong, conceptual knowledge is important, but getting something done for us is the basis to then build conceptual knowledge off of. And finally, it's the courage to learn to do and to self-govern and self-manage that gets you the most important thing, which is learning how to be. Learning how to be kind and respectful, to think about your calling. Our particular acting is non-religious. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. We believe in, the, in economic, religious, and political freedoms. We have people that will profess, including myself, will talk about our Christian beliefs and how it's helped us. We won't evangelize, we'll actually witness. That's okay in the school, in fact, it's welcome as well as someone to explain why they're not a believer. We're not, we do have actions that are actually much more explicitly uh, Christian, but even there we ask them to be, they have to be openly inquisitive about things. So this learn to be, the hero's journey, it's really the secular version of what we're all looking for and what Father Sirico talks about when he talks about the entrepreneurial vocation. So I'd like to stop there for a few minutes and uh, before we wrap up, take any questions. It's a lot to throw at you. Yes, sir. Sure. So let me make sure I understand the question. Um, how do I know if someone is, let's say writing, for example, um, how do I know someone should be critiquing me, knows enough to even tell me where to put the period? So it turns out to be interesting. We we've, we've found, I'm going to take writing for an example for a second because it's one of the hardest ones. We found that the secret to becoming a good writer is writing a lot and caring about writing well. And it ter it's terrific when you find somebody who's a peer who can critique you and get, who's actually a better writer. But it's actually just as important if it's your friend and you want to write well for them, or your friend wrote a critique and now you've got to improve the piece. So the secret to becoming a writer, a better writer, is writing a lot and getting better. Uh, and I'm going to get to how we know it's good critique. In fact, Charlie and I were talking about this. He's been working a lot in his writing. And I said, you know, this is just a silly mathematical formula, but if you just get 5% better a week, you're 12 and a half times a better writer at the end of the year. So it's just, a, it, you just have to, those of us that write a lot, you just have to write a lot. So what we found is that, that wanting to get better, the grammar is easy, thinking clearly is hard, that's where Socratic discussions uh, are important. Uh, but, so, but the level of peer critique quickly becomes actually pretty good. Often it's just warm, cool critique. What, what did you like, what did you not like? Then it could be six traits critique, uh, going through a series of more formal critique. We, the thing we do that actually works really well is you'll always have to force rank, like the five items that we're critiquing against. And often, by the way, we won't give the uh, rubric. We'll say, here's a Hemingway short story. Uh, here's one by um, O. Henry. Which one of them is better on these six points? Force rank the two of them. And they will develop a new rubric that they can then use and will own for, let's say, six weeks to work on short stories. But it's comparing against that rubric, discussing it, but more importantly, just rewriting a lot. And there's plenty of great advice on the internet. I mean, there's plenty, and so they go seek it on their own. Now, here's one thing, though. This is a market-based system, right? Your badges, when you, when you're, you and I are friends, and we really kind of tired of writing because it's kind of gotten hard. So I'm going to make a little deal with you. If you'll approve my badge, I'll approve yours, right? <laughs> I mean, not everybody has to work at a state house to be this corrupt. You, it happens naturally. <laughs> so, so we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna have this little deal going. The problem is every so often we'll take a 360 anonymous review in the, in the studio and say, who should be audited? Now, everybody in there knows who should be audited, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll come up with the three or four that – come off of that survey. We won't tell who came off the survey, and then we'll at random, they know we'll at random pull three or four more out of the crowd. But you don't know which list you came off of. Then the auditors will begin working on your latest set of badges. Now guess who wants to be on the audit committee, right? The very best writers are always on the, on the audit committee. And if you're flagged for audit, you can appeal, but let's say you don't reach the appeal, you lose a badge because you wrote a bad badge. I approved it, I lose a badge. That's six weeks worth of work. And all of our badges will now be audited, not just the ones that were drawn at random. 
Trust me that once you lose a badge because you, you gave a friend a pass, it's over with. In fact, the thing we have to do is pull them back from being too hard on each other. Uh, the difficulty is they are now really charging. In fact, we're, even last night we were talking about going to, we have a whole internal uh, currency system where they earn money and spend it internally. And we said we may actually instead of lose a badge, go to five Eagle Bucks, which is about a week's worth of work as a penalty because the badge is so extreme. But anyway, that's a long explanation. But there's a, there's a system of incentives that are mainly designed to get you to ride a lot and to get pretty good feedback. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I'm cu curious about the balance between the use of computers and iPads. And as I look around this lovely auditorium and see the books on the walls, the libraries that we've accumulated, most of us through our lifetime, um, there is uh, evidence now that some of the great classics uh, on online that are being used uh, are being, um, shall we say, censored or changed. Huh. And so I'm kind of anxious to know how can you uh, make sure that if you're using online resources that they're true to their original uh, writings and so forth. Because, you know, it's, it's like the Wizard of Oz, the uh, great wizard behind the curtain right. that's pulling, pulling kind of strings. And how do you encourage your kids to read the original works and perhaps even in book form because those are tried and true that are a little bit harder to change. Okay, so I love books, so I'm on your side in this one, right? But I'm losing the battle, but I'm on your side. Um, so let me answer it a couple of ways. One, uh, our English course, if you think of it that way, is really uh, 10 badges. It's four deep books and six, six major writing, writing projects will get you a year's worth of transcripts somewhere else. We don't care about the transcripts, but that... A deep book is a life-changing, world-changing book, which means it, it won the Pulitzer, it's by Mark Twain. I mean, it has to be that level book. What we found is if we let young people start reading comic books and we just encourage them to read fun, it doesn't matter what they start with. Over time, they very quickly start reading better and better and better books, what we would consider deeper books. Some of them, not all of them. Um, let them start with Harry Potter. I, mean, I actually like, I enjoyed Harry Potter. You'll be st stunned that by middle school, they're reading War and Peace or Daniel Jorgen's The Prize, and people start reading deeper and deeper and deeper books. The last time we surveyed, uh, the, the average middle schooler had read 16 books in a year. The person that read the lowest number of books was seven. That is probably six and a half more than the average in most schools. And, and, most, and many of the, some of these are not you know, deep books. They, that wasn't all deep books. Some of them are just romance novels. But they have to read four deep books a year. The internet, uh, our students really, they're on, they're on a computer to maybe um, write something or to research something quite often if they're working. They're not, they, they can't play games or surf the internet. That's against the honor code that they've, they've developed themselves. Um, the game-based math programs and those kind of things probably are an hour, hour and a half a day. So if you think of that as being on the computer, they're only on it an hour, an hour and a half a day. They are incredibly good at, at finding things on the internet, and they will argue about them. You should have been in our political and economics quest. Uh, they will argue subjects and then ferret out that each other's information is wrong. So I'll never think that my source of going to Fox News is wrong, but if you're going to CNN, you will call me on it. We'll eventually get down to real sources. So I'm sure somebody could run a fake version of Wealth and Nations somehow. I mean, but it can't be too far off. Or frankly, the market catches it. I mean, people will have these debates, and, and uh, we have one communist in the school, or he's left now, but one communist and, and one arch capitalist who's sitting over here, and they used to have these bitter debates. So, you know, he couldn't have passed too much by him because they, they actually do the research. We've got time for probably two more because I promised I'd wrap up on time. When, when's the ideal time for a, for a student to start and how do you handle somebody who comes in like late in the program maybe in junior high or something? That's a great question. The question is, how, what's the right time for a student to start? The answer is the right time for a parent to start is as early as possible. So the young people don't turn out to be a problem. Right, Matt? Matt's shaking his head. The parents can, you know, truthfully, the, parent, the parents are the issue most of the time. 
Better that we get them younger in elementary studio. They can adapt pretty quickly in middle school. High school's a little late for us because our two thirds of our middle schoolers have placed out of high school. So it's really hard for someone to come in in high school and be as self-managed and self-governed and at the academic level, and we don't care, it's all self-paced, so we don't, we don't care about the academic level, but they are pretty advanced. Most of them have had, Charlie's had five or six apprenticeships by now out in the real world. So it's hard to take someone who's been in the system as a freshman in, in high school. It can happen, but it's harder. Uh, we, we like them to be able to read, so we, we six or seven for us, but a lot of the Actons will start them at four and five and earlier uh, for market-based reasons more than as much as anything. So uh, a lot of our Actons have preschool programs. We think, we personally think Montessori, I think Montessori does a great job, but I understand why some want to have that for marketing reasons. So as early as possible for the parents. How about one more? Back here, Jeff. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you'd mentioned about your learning, doing, and being. Uh, uh, you'd mentioned that uh, you have the kids go out and do difficult goals, come up with difficult goals that uh, you go out and find the process. Uh, what might be some examples that uh, yeah. those difficult goals might be, and are they community-related? Are they American-related, world-related, whatever? Sure. Well, they can be all over the map, and there's six of them a year. There's seven of them a year. One's... one's uh, you get to craft your own. But there's six structured ones a year. They last about six weeks. It's like a software sprint. You work yourself to death for six weeks, do a public exhibition, then you get a week off. So our school basically goes year round with a short summer break and goes in these sprints. So an example, one of my favorites, and I mentioned this a second ago we did, we were trying to learn about electricity. So this is middle school electricity. And there's all sorts of great, by the way, simulations to learn about electricity. I was a petroleum engineer, which is basically an electrical engineer in college. And, you know, we never had the tools that you have now as simulations for engineering. But what the, what the young people had to do is they had to build a city, and every house had a different number of LEDs of different voltages and amps in it. So, so if you had one kind of house, it had a red. If you had a concert hall, it had three reds. So there were different electricity requirements in each building, and you had to build a physical block of a city. If you had so many houses, you needed a grocery store. The grocery store had different electricals. So this is a pretty complicated thing to figure out the voltage of your system, right, and how many amps you need. And the game went on that you had to figure out if you wanted coal-fired power, and that was at some price, but if you rolled the dice, uh, and bought wind power and the wind didn't blow. So they were all, it, it was basically a market in electricity. But here's the coolest thing. You, the bigger the city got, and those of you who understand power laws, you know, the more denser and bigger the city, the richer the city. Just how, we don't know why, that's how it works. So to win the game, you had to ally with other people and put your city blocks together. Now, remember I picked nine volts, Tom picked 12 volts. Someone else. So now I've got a very complicated electrical problem that you can't even solve mathematically. And we've got to decide how to make our streets work and how to get enough grocery stores. It is, by the way, exactly how a city would develop. And the question for the year was, all, we always have an overarching question like, does power corrupt? And the question for the year was, is it better to plan or create? And so the question was, are great cities, do they emerge or are they planned? And all sorts of discussions about zoning, about Robert Moses, if you know about Moses' uh, past, and about uh, Jane Jacobs, so all these deep Socratic discussions. But at the end of the day, they've got to put together to win all these city blocks, power them at the lowest cost to get the maximum profit from the city. I learned more in six weeks, I kid you not, than my entire college career in electrical engineering. I, know so, I knew so little about electricity and so much more at the end of this. But there's an example of one six-week project where they came out with a very um, intuitive grasp of what electricity is and how it works, as well as how to work the, run the uh, calculations. All right, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions afterwards, but for in, in defense of you've got a lot to do, let me finish with this. And if you want to join the revolution, there's a lot of stuff left undone that we're not going to get to. I'm going to give you five world-class opportunities. The first one is the hardest. I'm giving it to Rich Vetter. He's already, he's, already, he's already said he would take this one on. I honestly don't know how to solve the first one of these, but it's going to have all sorts of interesting market opportunities. The first one is 
to profit from the looming collapse of the postmodern university. Um, this is the number of people in uh, massive online courses, the number of universities, and the number of courses. Some of the MOOCs are good, some are not so good. That's not the point. The point is that now you can get your freshman and sophomore years virtually for free online very quickly. We estimate that the Acton Academy students in 500 hours of work can make A's on their freshman, sophomore years of school, of, of college, before they leave high school. Everybody's headed that way. If you talk to college, if you've got college age kids, we, they all know this. Here's the deal. Universities make 150% of their contribution off the freshman and sophomore years. If those become free, it's game over. It's game over for Harvard, it's game over for U University of Texas, and it's certainly game over for every small, mediocre university in the United States. They cannot sustain giving away their freshman and sophomore years for free. That's where they're headed. There are gonna be enormous opportunities when people start to focus on competence over prestige. Prestige is going to get become a commodity, uh, I predict, fairly soon. Second and more fun opportunity is, well, no, this is actually harder. How do you equip parents for this transformational journey? My little grid here is something I used at a parent meeting recently that, you know, it, it seems to us, the parents we see, and, and, and by the way, I've made every mistake as a parent you can make, and Charlie could tell you a lot about a lot of them. So I'm not preaching as a great parent, I'm preaching as a parent that's working on it. But we see increasingly that parents that either have fuzzy and narrow and always changing boundaries, which is a definition of crazy, you're changing the rules all the time and they're not clear, or they micro-parent or micromanage, or they don't manage at all, do have an impact on their children. Some of them turn out great, but there's a correlation from what we see from people that can self-manage and go through this hero's journey, a negative correlation to those three styles, and a positive correlation to parents who Maybe at a younger age, start out with clear but, but narrower boundaries, but as quickly as they can, widen those boundaries, keep them very explicit, and parent with what the equivalent of would be love and logic. Someone needs to get, I mean, I, this is just a desperate thing to do to how can we attract more parents into what I would think of as more market-based parenting. And we see the damage is done not doing this every day. Uh, option number three, this is something I've been talking to Acton Institute about, our six and seven year olds can have powerful Socratic discussions about civilization, our word for history. You would be stunned to hear them talk about Machiavelli. And there's stuff on the internet that they can watch or read that'll teach them something about Machiavelli to have an ar a moral argument. This is a, a rudimentary site put together by a fellow in, in, in Europe in his spare time, but it basically allows you, like Wikipedia, to surf topic to topic. So I can go look at all the popes, or I can dig down into Italy, or I can look at the 15th century, or I can look at everyone who's ever done something with cowboys. It's got thousands of Wikipedia, but geospatially and time-oriented things to look at. Khan Academy in math now has 50 million users. Remember I told you that you can go all the way through calculus in our program very quickly. We just had one student do it in one year with no teacher. If you did this and you put Socratic discussion questions with every one of these nodes and you could surf through different parts of history but have, have engaging Socratic discussions, you would have no need for a social studies teacher. That would be over. I think we could build this, and I would fund it if I could find somebody to build it for probably a million dollars. And if you could get the user interfaces right, which is a big if, you know, Khan has 50 million users. And you could have people having moral, difficult, powerful, and by the way, the only discussions they wanna have are moral discussions. It's not interesting if there's not a moral component. Um, we already have 370 of these built for our own program, 370 discussions built, mainly around the great courses, the college level super courses, that's what our middle schoolers and high schoolers do. But to build this, um, you need someone who can write great Socratic questions and has a real depth of history. And by the way, they have to be honest. You don't you know, try to get somebody to believe in capitalism. You lay out both sides and you let people fight. It's gotta be a legitimate argument. Number four, same thing for writing. This is just the six traits of how we go through, but um, there's a way to build a learner-driven, peer-reviewed writing, and there's some things out there that are okay, but for a million dollars, you could build a very powerful peer-driven writing program, I'm convinced now. I've seen the beautiful writers our young people become with no, zero writing instruction from an adult in the room. Lots of instruction from around the world, 
Don't get me wrong, they had a lot of teachers, just not in the room. But this is probably another million dollar project to kick off that if you did it right, uh, you would have another Khan Academy for writing. And then finally, this is um, the old Horatio Alger stories. I'm convinced as I look back at the revolution, one of the reasons the United States worked is there were 30 million or so of these dime store novels in print all about how you too can make it from rags to riches and succeed. We have increasingly in this country begun to embrace a victim mentality, I think. I believe that there are thousands of these stories out there. If we could think of a way virally to create them, you begin to spread the hero's journey. That's something Charlie's gonna talk about at 4.30, another project we have to do that. So, let me finish. Um, if you listen closely, I believe you will hear the footsteps of an ever-growing army of young people voting with their feet. They're voting with their feet to take online courses in college. They're increasingly voting with their feet to go to charter schools. And even in a small, minor way, the parents and children are voting with their feet to attend places like Acton Academy. And we're just one flavor of 100 flavors that need to flourish. The learner-driven education is coming. Human beings do not want to be chained to a desk. They want to be free to flourish and become who they were meant to be. If you are in this business like I am, you can cling to and want to ride out the storm, but you will join, I think, the journalists and taxi cab drivers and, and budget motel operators and how much fun they're having in this new world, which isn't much. Instead, you could join the revolution, pick one of these five super projects or one of your own and find a way to become a part of the revolution. So I'll leave you with this. The next time you come across a young person, if you don't do anything else, the next time you come across a young person who reminds you of yourself when you were five or six years old, don't dismiss their superhero dreams. Instead, tell them you believe that they are a hero on a hero's journey who deserves to find a calling. Who knows? Those simple words of encouragement and affirmation just might change a life, a life of someone who just might change the world. Thank you.